years. My name is Jasmine Jenkins, and I am a first year doctoral student in counseling psychology at the University of Georgia. I'm also the mentor mentee co chair within the Division 45 Student Committee. And we thought that it was really important to host this webinar because many people around the world are significantly impacted by the killing of black people at the hands of the police. And we know that ourselves as psychologists are included in those individuals that are impacted. And um, however, we have the unique position of also caring for others. And so we really wanted to be able to touch on how we can care for ourselves while caring for others as psychologists in training as it pertains to Black Lives Matter. So. Um, we have the wonderful Dr. Kyra Banks, who's going to be leading this, and Dessa Daniel, who is going to give you a little bit more information about Division 45 and how you can get involved. Um, so just to give you a little bit of a layout on how this is going to work, Dessa's going to speak, and then I'm going to introduce Dr. Banks. She's going to speak and go over some of her slides, give us some wonderful information for about 15 to 20 minutes, and then we'll allow an open dialogue. We'll answer some questions that you may have. Like Dessa said, you can type them in the comments box. We will get them, and we will try to get to everyone's comments and then we will be recording this and so we will upload it to the student webinar section on the division 45 website so dessa if you want to make a couple of announcements Yes. Um, again, hello everyone. My name is Daisy Daniel. I am a doctoral student, a second year doctoral student at Kansas State University. Um, and I want to send a special thank you to my school for hosting this Zoom meeting. Um, and again, like I said, I'm going through and muting your mic just so that we can have an as clear um, video recording as possible. Again, this is being recorded so that we can place it on our Division 45 website um, for people to view later. Um, as for Division 45, so um, Division 45 is a part of um, the American Psychological Association. Uh, we do have a full student committee. Um, I am currently taking applications for that student committee. All of that information you can find out on our actual um, Division 45 website, um, or you can join us on our Facebook page. So there's plenty of things to get involved in. Um, if you are not attending APA, um, please stay in touch with us either through Facebook or Twitter, um, some of our handles that way. Um, if you are joining us at APA, we would love to see you at our suite, uh, but also throughout the conference. Um, and there's several things going on there as well. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, now I'm going to introduce Dr. Banks. Dr. Kyra Banks is an associate professor of psychology at St. Louis University and focuses on race, racial identity, and intergroup relations. She has worked in the field to understand the deleterious effects of discrimination, to identify potential buffers, and to improve intergroup relations since 1998 through research, community outreach, and school-based interventions. Most recently, she has served as a racial equity consultant for the Ferguson Cons Commission, in addition to being active in local activism. Dr. Banks. Well, thank you both for inviting me uh, to be a part of this webinar. It's a, a special honor for me because I was a part of Division 45 when I was a graduate student at the University of Michigan, so happy to be able to give back. Um, so yeah, when you all asked me to speak about this topic, um, I just want to be clear, my talk is really going to be focused on as graduate students in training um, to be clinicians, to be psychologists, to be in the field, helping other people. How can you care for yourself while you're caring, working for, working to understand um, others and how the trauma might impact other people and it will impact you as well. And so. Um, my idea is that I'm going to give you some of the literature about and around um, not only burnout generally, but also trauma and race-based trauma. Do you hear an echo? Yeah, I wonder if somebody has me I not. Guess. I'm sorry. Okay, great. That's okay. Uh, so, yeah, so my thought is to give you some research on burnout generally in the field, uh, and then specifically in terms of race-based trauma. Uh, some thoughts and ideas about how you might navigate uh, and plan for your own self-care, how I've done some of that, how I've helped other folks do that that have been active in the field, and then also some resources. And then, of course, hoping that we can have some discussion. Yep, so that's what I'm thinking. 
So I um, had this conversation with Jasmine and Desa as we were planning for this. Um, oftentimes people use the hashtag Black Lives Matter. And I think because it is so powerful, it's, it speaks for itself. It is um, so clear what the message is. Uh, but I also like to place it in the larger context. So Black Lives Matter is an organization and a part of a broader movement for black lives. And so uh, you can visit their website, movementforblacklives.org. And I just took a little screenshot of the number of, uh, number of organizations that, uh, that collaborate to make up the movement for black lives. And there's a pledge and demands and, and can give you more information. And the reason, one of the reasons why I share this is because Black Lives Matter, um, is that does not have chapters all over the country. And so if, if it's something that you want to be connected with in terms of like the activism and actually doing actions, uh, these organizations are organizations that you should consider seeking out. Uh, and just to say briefly, you know, I've always been interested in how discrimination imp impacts mental health. And it just recently, actually, somebody in my family said, you know, I, I thought you were interested in how discrimination impacts. I specifically focus on depressive symptoms in particular, not necessarily the disorder of depression, but depressive symptoms broadly. Uh, and they're like, yeah, I always thought you did that because it was interesting. And now I realize having had a lot of the symptomatology myself that you did it because it actually happened. I was like, oh, great. Now you understand why I'm doing what I'm doing. Um, and just to name that, yes, it's something that I think has become real and present in the lives of more people, not just black people, but people in general who care about humanity and who care about uh, having empathy for, for the number of people who are affected by police violence and violence in all sorts of ways and social injustice. So just to give that context. Um, so I mentioned I'm going to talk about burnout generally, um, just to say this idea of burnout, it's not new. We're, we talk about it. We hear a lot of people talking about self-care nowadays, uh, but the idea about burnout specifically in the helping profession has been around for a long time. And it was thought that it might happen when there was severe stress in, uh, in a helping profession. Uh, then it later was understood to be more multidimensional and not just realized to be in the workplace, but in all sorts of places. So you can have burnout as a stay-at-home mom. You can have burnout in any profession. Um, and that generally it's defined as the state of physical, emotional, psychological, and spiritual exhaustion uh, resulting from chronic exposure um, to, to populations that are vulnerable or suffering. suffering. Uh, and I would say just chronic exposure to stressful events broadly. Right. And so that is the general sense of like how we understand burnout in the field of psychology. And it's something that we should be thinking about um, even outside of the context of racial trauma. But of course, today we want to focus specifically on that. What are some of the impacts that burnout can have on clinicians? Um, it is one of the most common personal consequences of people practicing therapy. And there's a way in which it can lead to poor job performance. So people who are burned out and aren't able to either identify that for themselves or cope with it can become disenchanted, discouraged, irritated, frustrated, confused, and basically just not be able to perform as well. And I've heard that from some of my graduate students just feeling like, you know, I can't quite get going. My motivation to get my work done isn't there. I feel like I'm, I'm overwhelmed, even though the number of tasks that I have isn't greater, but that there's some real stress that's happening for people with the almost daily at times experiences uh, of racial trauma that we're seeing on the, on the news. Another thing is just people feeling emotionally bankrupt, that they don't have the skills to manage what's happening, that they don't have time for relaxation or leisure or any sort of renewal. And I would encourage everyone, those in training in particular, to, to realize that these concepts can happen in the experience and the impact can happen to folks just by being in grad school. And you might know someone who has had this experience um, simply by being a graduate student and having numerous um, obligations. And especially if you're in the clinical field, being responsible for not only 
mastering your work in terms of your research, but also your clinical work. Um, I want to talk briefly about kind of some of the key features of burnout, and then I'm going to link that directly to the race-based trauma literature. So when we think about burnout theory, um, so ha having an understanding of some of the key features can decrease your vulnerability. So if you know what some of the key features are of burnout, you can catch it before you get to that point of being bankrupt. You can know the warning signs for yourself and what are the symptoms. And then you can educate yourself around self-care strategies, right? And so that's what I hope to help you all do today. So this is a model that kind of gives you a visual of some of the key features, their exhaustion, cynicism, and ineffectiveness. And so you basically want to catch yourself before you you get to this point, right? That, that makes sense. And these are some of the symptoms of burnout. So internally feeling the apathy, hopelessness, exhaustion, it seems to come quickly, disillusionedness, melancholy, forgetfulness, irritability, and experiencing work as a burden. So something you used to love to do that you worked really hard to get into a program to do no longer feels joyful, right? That externally you might alienate yourself, feel very cynical towards your clients, um, might feel some contempt, have difficulty maintaining professional boundaries with clients and maybe even withdraw from your colleagues. So I want to link this briefly to what we're seeing consistently in the media around racial racialized violence and in particular police brutality. Um, the reason why I wanted to give you the literature from the psychological perspective first is that I think even though and most of the people on this call probably know someone or personally experience a sense of like exhaustion around the repeated um, uh, repeated individuals that we're hearing about in terms of say her name or say his name. We feel like another name, really another person that's brutally killed or maybe even um, just neglectfully killed in police custody and it gets exhausting yet. I've heard a number of people say, oh, but that couldn't be what's affecting my productivity. Oh, that can't be why I can't quite get going. And I, I really want to name and uh, normalize the fact that, yeah, these symptoms that we're talking about in terms of feeling burnt out, unable to get going, uh, can absolutely be uh, a result of experiencing prolonged race-based trauma. And so... If this idea of race-based trauma is a new concept, I put a few different directions from which this idea comes from. So it's been around for some time, and I mean, I would argue that even mo many uh, black historians, sociologists talked about the concept, but didn't necessarily name it as such. Uh, and that from a number of different theories, racial trauma is is it can be inter or intrapersonal, so it's something that can happen inside an individual, between individuals. It can be vicarious. It can also be a community experience, right? And so we might see physical or psychological symptoms after some sort of stressful experience. We might see symptoms such as fear, anger, yeah. symptoms, hypervigilance, headaches, pneumonia, maybe body aches, difficulty with your memory, or experiencing things like self-blame or confusion. I never want to go to Center City, but I guilt. The darn sure don't want to go so now. So in terms of the race-based trauma, um, I want to name how, let's take, for example, uh, Philando Castile, you know, I'm not today just going to name, I'm not going to show videos of, of any police violence. Like I know that there's been some discussion about like, do you show those videos or do you not? And I mean, personally, my, my thought is that we need to be sensitive to people engaging in that media choicefully and that it's something that people choose to do for themselves at a time that works for them, not, um, without warning not and there's been even discussion like with twitter when you screen when you scroll through to not have videos immediately play same with facebook and i want to argue that with his case in particular there were a number there were a number of levels of trauma right if we think about um the experience of those who were actually in his car streaming um those who watched the stream uh those who were necessarily uh, connected to him in some way. Uh, I had an odd connection in that he worked at a Montessori school. 
and I'm a part of a Montessori community because my children go there and I do some research in Montessori school. So immediately my distance from his experience, it's, it seemed to shorten, right? Then there's vicarious and then community, right? Like as a black community or as a community of humans, like what does this do to us to see this sort of trauma happen, racialized trauma happen over and over? And then intergenerational trauma, which has uh, been discussed in a number of ways, but specifically thinking about the cumulative effect of psychological wounds and from racial trauma over time, right? And how does that get transmitted? And we have really new information around epigenetics and the way in which epigenetics um, might be a key to help us understand how trauma is transmitted through generations, but it also can be transmitted via socialization or education, right? So on a very short or very small scale, the talk that a lot of black families have with their children, right? That is transmitting the kind of intergenerational fear and um, the history of how you need to make sure you do everything you can, which some people talk about like the respectability politics of doing all that you can to make sure that you're not treated in a way that is harmful. And yet we know that there's nothing that you can necessarily do um, there's nothing you can do or wear or be that that you're not that would keep you from being that threat, right? And if anyone's read um, Isabel Wilkerson's book, *The Warmth of Other Suns*, it's a it's a beautiful read of families in the Great Migration. And reading that book for me was a a way of under a, a new way to understand the intergenerational ways in which stories and narratives are shared, and it's not always. Uh, identified as intergener intergenerational trauma, but the reason why those some of those stories are shared and told is to carry on those messages to attempt to try to protect future generations. Um, Dr. Deguri's work on post-traumatic slave syndrome is squarely in the in that area of intergenerational tra trauma. So again, to give you a little bit of that literature, so if you want to learn more, ask more about it afterwards, um, we can talk about it. So that's some background, and I'm, in my time left, I want to talk about coping with this trauma. So uh, coping with burnout generally, but then overlaying it specifically with the race-based trauma. And I want to just name that there's no one way, there's no right way, that it's a matter of um, simply finding what works for you. So I've, I've outlined internal and external ways that you might cope with trauma and the internal ways, the first one is acknowledgement, right? So to acknowledge that as somebody in the helping profession that you're not immune to also being traumatized by what you're helping others navigate. And so I think that acknowledgement is sometimes taken for granted. Uh, we don't necessarily stop as people who are helpers to realize that we might also need to be in the position of being helped. So acknowledgement is important. And for some people, this, the idea of like meditation doesn't have to be sitting quiet for hours. Uh, even if it's just deep breathing can be a helpful tool. Journaling, there's been some research and we know in terms of even some of the trauma treatment in terms of cognitive, uh, the cognitive behavioral processing and journaling plays a, a large role in that. So there's a lot of healing that can come from journaling. Taking social media breaks. I don't know how many of you have seen, you know, friends will say, you know what, I'm stepping off social media for a while, given that my newsfeed is filled with things that are not helping me cope with what's already, what I know is happening in the world. And then religious and spiritual practices can be internal ways that you can cope with trauma. And you'll see I have that in both internal and external, because in the external ways, that you might think about coping with trauma, you can engage those practices in groups. So you can do group practices, whether it's for some people going to church or other people doing uh, you know, new moon or full moon um, ceremonies around the birth or the, tur the turn of a new time. Uh, having a discussion or support group, it could be for some book clubs around knowledge and for others just time to get together and vent and discuss that community and connection and social support can can be very healing um, social events so just next pushing yourself to get out so to not engage yourself in the isolation 
but to push yourself to be engaged and involved. And then for some people, being involved in activism and in actions, literal actions, can be a way to cope with the trauma. I have a, a, a colleague that I've worked with before who ha struggles with depression. And she's talked about feeling very stressed because of the chain of events that happened a few weeks ago with Alton Sterling and Philando Castile and then the shootings in Dallas. She was feeling on edge. <clears throat> Her son, who is a young black boy, wasn't there. He was traveling with family. And so what she did to cope was to go out to one of the marches, to go out to one of the actions. And, you know, that was her saying, I'm doing this for me. And I'm also doing this for my son. Like, this is something I can do outside of myself to help myself cope and navigate with the weight of emotions that I'm feeling and that my history of depression and knowing that I need to do something actively rather than wait for, to, to feel like I'm overwhelmed by what I'm feeling. So I want to name one big important piece that there's been research to suggest that mindfulness can help us connect the self-care that we engage in and the well-being outcomes that we want. Right? So if we think about moderators and mediators, mediators are those things that are the catalysts, right? That can help us understand the relationship between two variables. And so if we understand that there are lots of components of self-care, we've been physical, psychological, spiritual, the actual social support, that mindfulness is a key mediator, which means that's what makes that relationship happen. It's the catalyst between self-care and well-being. So if we can engage in all these things, we can do these things. We might be able to go to this protest or do this journaling, but that we might be able to enhance our self-care activities and the connectivity to our um, the extent to which it predicts our well-being if we also engage in mindfulness. So I can talk more about that if folks have questions, but I think specifically, it means being in the present moment. It means not being necessarily stuck in the past or before we're thinking all the time, but to be in the present moment. And I do not want to estimate, underestimate how hard that can be for uh, those of you in training, right? You're constantly thinking about where are you going? How do you get to the next step, whether it's internship or postdoc? that publication. And so this idea of being in the present moment uh, is easier said than done. So let me just leave that there and we can talk about that more if folks want to. I want to name some specific resources that I think might be helpful to you all and uh, give you some kind of take home points and then we're open for discussion. Uh, so some of the resources that I think might, I think might be helpful uh, the Institute for the Study of uh, for the Study and Promotion of Race and Culture has put out uh, a, a document, and within that document is the Racism Recovery Recovery Plan, and they have the hashtag Races, Racial Trauma is Real, and so they've put out a, a number of uh, different social media campaigns under that hashtag. But the document itself, and if you Google Institute for so study of study and promotion of race and culture or racial trauma is real. You can get this resource. And I think it's a nice um, collection of materials that speaks specifically to how, how you manage racial trauma. And so it has this racism recovery plan and encourages you to think through what are my triggers? What does it look like when I'm getting to that point of almost being burned out rather than waiting until I am? And then if I get there, like, how do I work myself out of that space? Um, so for, the, for when things are really intense, I think there's some very good resources there. The other resources that I have are more of, if you, if you can get engaged with them sooner rather than later, they can help you navigate and cope proactively rather than only when things feel very intense and on edge. So the first one is Emotional Emancipation Circles. Um, and these were developed by the Association so Association for Black Psychologists and Community Health Network, and I have the website there, defythelie.org, actually takes you to CHN's website, and then you can navigate to get to the emotional emancipation circles. They were developed specifically for um, those of African descent, and they are thought to help, help individuals defy the lie of black inferiority. So if we think about what's at the core of the movement of black lives, why black lives matter is such a 
uh, a defiant statement. It's because at the core of that, we have been socialized in our country to believe in the inferiority of black lives. And so to speak affirmatively that our lives matter, that we deserve emotional wellness and emotional emancipation uh, is at the core of the emotional emancipation circles. And so if you want more information about that, the goal there is to think about how can we have emotional emancipation for people of African descent worldwide um, in a way that does not have to be dispensed by mental health professionals, by helping professionals. So they envision that it will be like you have go to a AA meeting and you're like, okay, what you know, what step are you on? Then you're constantly going and learning and growing. And now, right now, there's groups in Ghana, uh, Cuba, a lot in the U.S. There's some in Oak, the Oakland Bay Area, Atlanta. We just started a group here in St. Louis. And so, if you have an association of Black psychologists chapter, you might have one of these in your in your town. So that one is more specific to African Americans and people of African descent broadly. The second or the third resource is open to anyone. It's called Generative Somatics. And so I also have the website there. And it's a healing framework that integrates mind, body, and social movements. And so their idea is to help people think about how to experience the transformation and healing that can come from therapy, but not just from the talk therapy experience and deeply rooted in social justice. So they would argue that transform, transformation can't happen outside of the context of thinking about, critically thinking about social movements. And then the last one is not specific, but it's to say, you know, find out where your local grassroots organizations or collectives are. If we're very honest, which we're here to be very honest, even though we're here with the Division of 45 within APA, academia is a predominantly white mainstream endeavor, and that's, that's the space that we're located in. And so it sometimes helps to get out of the ivory tower and to connect with others. Of course, if you're in your department and you have people who are, who are passionate about these issues and can help you cope and navigate, that's great. That's wonderful. Take advantage of that. But if not, get connected with some local grassroots organizations. Uh, I've just saw today there was a group in Philly, a therapist in Philly, who started collecting names of mental health professionals that would see people either for for sliding fee or reduce for pro bono or pro bono. In St. Louis, right after Ferguson happened, we did the same thing. We Association of Black Psychologists gathered a list of of names, put it on our website, so people could find help that they felt was culturally competent and available to them. There are a number of, of organizations that I mentioned even at the beginning to find if there are chapters of those organizations in your town or is there an anti-racist collective or showing up for racial justice. Um, so seek out those organizations or collectives as a, as a resource and use them. So my last comment, and then I want us to have time for questions, um, is to say, this is my take-home point, that integrating self-care, it's a both and rather than an either or. And so that you don't have to feel like I either have to, you know, I have to get myself together before I can help other people. It's an and. Who, else, who is perfect, right? And so if we had to wait until we're perfect to help other people, there would be no helpers, right? So it's a both and. How are you actively working to manage your own emotions and your experience and work with other people? Uh, it's not, oh, I have to either get myself together or I can't be a helper. Uh, how are you working to be able to keep some balance? And so I wanna just name that self-care can be a variety of things. Oftentimes you see a lot of, uh, a lot of articles calling for self-care and naming it's this or that, or it's not this or it's not that. And I, I would argue that it depends on what you need for yourself. Um, for some people, it's being near water. For other people, it's walking in a, the woods, that you've got to find what feeds you and what resources you. And that might mean trying out a lot of different things, asking other people what's their, what's their source of resilience, what feeds them, and trying them out for yourself. You know, maybe you have that one song that you know you can put on that can, at least can get you going and moving. Uh, make sure you balance time for, and this might sound like a duh statement, but you know, those basic necessities in life and those pleasurable activities. 
and your professional and personal. And uh, again, just naming the fact that you all are at a really tense and time consuming time of your life, it's easy to let your training take over your life and that that isn't going to help you uh, when things get out of whack or out of balance if you've already set things up where you're not giving yourself the time and care that you need. Uh, think about your personal warning signs of burnout. If you don't know what yours are, enlist a friend to help you identify them, right? Uh, their time, they might be able to see patterns in you that you don't. And you could say, I'm trying to figure out what it looks like for me before I get to that point, right? And so they might say, yeah, I noticed that when you spend an hour looking at all of the different news feeds of videos and police violence that you know, nobody can do any right and you're just edgy and you yell and you're right and you're on it we're on edge because you're on edge so maybe you take a social media break or maybe you limit your time of looking at that to only 15 minutes because it's not that we're asking you to be clueless to what's happening in the world but if you're one of those people that literally are impacted emotionally um and in terms of how you treat other people when you view those videos you need to figure out how to limit your viewing. I've had a lot of conversation with people saying, well, you know, if Emmett Till's mom hadn't had an open casket, no one would have known. We need to see these videos. Yes, and Emmett Till's picture was in the newspaper, not on Twitter and Facebook and the 24 hour news cycle and about 20 other places. So how do you manage your consumption? And then the last thing I'll say is to think proactively Create a daily or weekly practice for coping with racial trauma. You know, what does that look like? Who do you gather with on a regular basis that you know knows you well enough or that you can be open enough with uh, to help you navigate what you're feeling? Or what is the practice daily? You know, I notice for myself, if I can wake up in the morning and just do, even if it's 10 minutes of just focusing on my breath, not getting anybody ready. I have two kids, you know, so not getting the kids ready, not talking to my partner, not doing anything, just breathing. And I can get out to the park and walk. Either one of those uh, or both is great. My day goes much better. I'm much more able to, to navigate what comes my way. When I see something that's triggering or if I hear a comment by a colleague or a student or a client, I'm much more centered to be able to respond to what's coming to me in a way that's choiceful rather than reactive. And so to me, that's taking care of myself and acknowledging what I need to do to be my best self. And I think that is it. So I'll stop talking and I look forward to your questions. So Dr. Bank, we had a question already um, from, um, a, I think a student in, they said, could you please elaborate on how mindfulness could be used to deal with trauma? Yeah. <clears throat> so, um, so I just want to reiterate that study was about mindfulness in the link between self-care and well-being, right? And so in terms of dealing with trauma, I think the way in which um, we might encourage people to engage in things like journaling or to um, you know, be exposed to whatever was traumatic and in, in the moment realize that it's not happening and that they have gained the tools to be able to manage those emotions. Um, that is a little bit of how like the present moment can help. Uh, but that's part of a larger protocol. Right, so the study that I was mentioning was the, the fact that mindfulness was a mediator between the self-care that we do and the well-being that we're hoping the self-care can enhance. And so I think those are two different things. And just to be clear, I think mindfulness can um, be a catalyst for having that self-care help uh, because I could be, I mentioned my self-care, things like meditating or walking in the park. Um, I could walk on my I'll walk in the park and be on my phone and not you know I could do all sorts of other things and I might not fully reap the benefits of that walk in the park because I wasn't being present in the park I was answering email I was doing all sorts of other things that was wasn't being present or I could meditate and I could have sat there for ten minutes but if I 
rather than just observe my thoughts and watch them go by, I have gone off and, you know, planned my son's birthday and I've rewritten that manuscript in my head. I, I wasn't present in the moment to reap the benefits of the, the deep breathing. So if that makes sense, great. If not, maybe reframe your question. But I, I want to just separate that the piece about mindfulness being a mediator was specifically around the relationship between self-care and well-being. Okay, it seemed like that worked really well. Um, so we are going to open it up to more questions, but also any comments or dialogue you want to contribute, we would love to hear. So I will go with the first question. Yeah. Uh, and this is really for anyone, but especially in our current climate, there's so much kind of going on, um, especially as a doctoral student myself. Do you have any advice or any examples for us of how do we be like social, social justice change agents, but also keep it professional? Like how do we be involved and push the dialogue and challenge the norms, but also maintain our professional integrity, like whether it at APA or ABSI or at our universities and in our departments? So um, I appreciate you asking that question because I wasn't sure where this was going to fit in, but I just would like to share that it's really important for you to know your system. <clears throat> so know your institution. Um, and that means getting, you know, going to have, uh, going to office hours, going to have a conversation with a faculty member that you might not work personally with. You never know where your allies are gonna be, is what, I, what I'm saying. And so I think the way that you can be a change agent is to be embedded in the system um, and tr this whole idea of like try not to necessarily perpetuate the system and be able to still see it, but be in it because people are much more likely to hear your criticism if you can also show that you've been engaged and that you care about the organization. So this idea that um, you want to be a critical lover, so you don't want to be the critic solely because people stop hearing the critic who's always the critic, and you don't want to be that the pure lover that the institution can do no wrong. So how do you show people that you are a critical lover, that you care enough that you're going to give this critique? So as a student, that often means knowing the faculty well enough to know who might be receptive to what you're saying. So if you have something that you want to suggest, it might not necessarily mean going to the person who can make that happen. It might mean going to three other people that you know are receptive to your idea and strategize with them about the best way to make this happen. Does it need to come from the faculty? Does it need to be a memo from the students that's been voted on by the student body? Like what speaks the language of this is how we need to move? In this organization um, some organizations it might mean you know some sort of action like literally a walkout some organizations that would put uh, the leadership on defense rather than making them open to realizing this is a major issue so I think the biggest thing I would say is know your system know who your allies are and if you don't know who they are that means you have to do some work to getting to know people more and then um, the last thing I'd say is it's Honestly, as students, you have more power than you realize, right? You have a lot of power to say, this is my ask, this is what I expect, this is what I want. And if you can speak as a collective of students, like if you can get a list of ideas or suggestions or initiatives and some sort of student vote or endorsement or signature, I think that can help the faculty not feel like it's a, um, one person needs that are speaking and it's the group that has the concern. Awesome. Thank you so much. So we do have another question um, from Dr. Doris Carroll. Um, she says, what are some systematic or organizational strategies that I can recommend to my academic department or college to manage organizational race-based trauma? Mm. <clears throat> Yeah, so uh, one small thing that you might consider suggesting um, is having, and honestly, a number of institutions have this now, of having some database. So some people call it a bias incident protocol. 
uh, most institutions have them, and if yours doesn't, I would suggest it. Um, where are these incidents being collected? so that it doesn't have to be uh, the, at the risk of someone feeling vulnerable that they share these things, right? So that's one institutional structural thing you can do is to have some sort of repository where these experiences come, they can be de-identified if people want them to be, and then they can be um, shared in some way with the community to heighten people's awareness that this is happening and it's something that we need to address. Another, change that I've seen happen on a number of campuses is a, a institution institutionalizing discussions or dialogues. So whether it's a brown bag specifically on the topic or student faculty dialogues, some or a speaker series or even a, um, a conference where the the campus community works towards a conference that of course is on campus but also brings people from other areas. So Berea College just had a, a big conference on not specifically race-based trauma, but um, racism and dialogue. Uh, and St. Louis University, where I am, is having a, a conference coming up in a couple weeks specifically around racism and activism, since it will be our two-year anniversary of the Occupy SLU movement when a protest came to our campus and our campus was occupied. Uh, something else that actually SLU did after we had the occupation, we, there was a, a, a day that was sanctioned by the president and the university as a day to talk about racism, which validates it for those who experience it and also names it and places it as, a, as something that's important to those that don't see it every day or don't get it as something that's important. And there was a, a collective where if you didn't feel as a faculty member comfortable bringing up the topic in your class, you could invite someone else in who, who was willing to kind of share their expertise. And so that created a climate on campus. So it wasn't just one faculty member saying, I'm gonna talk about racism, where everyone was expected to talk about the topic. Now I can, we, I won't go into the details. It wasn't, it wasn't all perfect, yeah. but it was an institutional kind of a, a mechanism for naming the trauma of racism and how it impacts people's lives on a daily basis. Okay, um, thank you. We have a question from Becca Fix, um, who says, what do you think is the best way to facilitate discussion about or introduce Black Lives Matter and racial trauma with clients? So, <clears throat> I think that it's important with all of our clients to be assessing how their specific social identities impacts and intersects with what they're presenting. Uh, I often, in my human diversity class, have my students learn the dead Lottie assessment, and it touches on all different social identities, and so it, it normalizes bringing in those social identities into the, the consulting room so that it's not a taboo topic, right? When we had on our campus, Occupy SLU was happening right here, which was clearly um, part of the larger Black Lives Move movement, Black Lives Matter movement. Um, we made sure, oh, hold on, sorry. My computer just gave me that your battery's about to go. Okay. We made sure that um, the student, that students who were working in our clinic, um, I made sure in my, in my team that they talked about it, that they named it, that some of the clients literally walked through the occupation to get to the consulting room. And so for us, it was an easy way to kind of just name what's happening in our city. Uh, if it's not happening in your city, I would say there's probably some example that it is. Yeah. I would just assess where people are with, with current events or, because I honestly, I have another student in my lab who studies Islamophobia and there's all sorts of ways in which, um, in terms of being Muslim in America, there's a lot of trauma there that's, that people are experiencing. And so I'm a big fan of assessing for what people bring into the room and, and then just be willing to listen and take their lead if they bring it up and not be scared to name it. So I had a student ask me about a white male colleague who, who was bringing up different issues of like white privilege and um, he was uh, trying to grapple and understand what that meant for him. And, he mentioned something about uh, just, you know, he was really frustrated that there were other white people who didn't get why black lives matter. And she's a woman of color and she was like, what, what do I do with that? Like, well, 
you explore it because he's bringing it in. Um, and so I guess my suggestion would be be listening and willing, be willing to go there, that it's not an untouchable thing. It's happening in our society. It's a discussion that uh, we, we shouldn't be surprised people are bringing in. And then also if it's pertinent to their identity, especially if they're African-American uh, or identify as black, to be willing to ask and assess for the extent to which it's something that is important to them or you think impact or they think impacts their presenting complaint. Okay, can you tell us the name of the assessment again and spell it for us? Sure, Deadlani, D-A-D-L-A-N-I. Uh, can I find it quickly? Culture at the Center, a reformulation of diagnostic assessment. Mamta Banu Dadlani, Christopher Overtree, Overtree, and Maureen Perry Jenkins. It's in a professional psychology research and practice. It's in a 2012 issue. Yeah. And it pushes you to think about not only the client, but also your own social identities. And then as you map how your identities and the client's identities might intersect and what you might want to think about as you engage in treatment with this individual. Okay, thank you. Yep. So one other little thing that I wanted to say, I don't know how we are on time, if this speaks to anyone, um, <clears throat> but also just be willing to be brave and be engaged. So as a psychologist, I knew that I was passionate about these issues. I've studied them forever. And when everything was happen happening in St. Louis, I felt really compelled to be out in the streets because that's where things were happening at that moment. And I just want to name that, you know, not everybody's front line is being literally out in activism, um, in actions. Your activism can happen in lots of different ways. It can happen through your research. It can happen through your clinical work, um, through the work that you do in your department institutionally. Uh, but for me at that moment, it felt really important to be present for mostly the young people that were out and wouldn't leave, would not leave. And if it had not been for their willing, their willingness to stand in front of tanks and and be um, subject to tear gas, like I don't know that we would be connecting all of these incidents. So these, all of the, the names that we have called up and held up in the past two years, sadly, they very well might have happened, but I don't know that we would have connected them in the same way. And so I just want to name that, you know, I, when I first went out, I was like, I'm a psychologist uh, and I believe in these issues. And then what started to happen is, I met other people in helping, helping professions. And so uh, I mentioned this, the Association of Black Psychologists, we started to collect names. Um, I went to a de-escalation training that talked about, and I think as clinicians, we're quite well suited to do that work because we do crisis work. And so in the moment during actions, how can we help de-escalate situations? Uh, I also became engaged with, um, with other psychologists who were willing to kind of be present and, and help people in the moment if they needed help, just like they have groups of medics that go out during actions to help folks. And so whatever it is that you feel passionate about, to again, if it's not within the walls of your institution, be willing to go out into the community and find it. It'll inform your research questions, it'll inform your clinical work, and you very well might find ways to use your skills as a mental health professional. Um, one of the ways in which I think I've been able to help is I happened to be out the night of the non-indictment when uh, Darren Wilson was not indicted for Michael Brown's shooting and, and um, was able to see for myself the way in which the treatment of the crowd changed as the crowd became um, less predominantly white and more predominantly black and uh, was unfortunately tear gassed. But the, as a result of that, there was a group of lawyers who wanted to, to file a federal injunction to say the police should not be tear gassing peaceful protesters because that's what was happening. And we, we didn't think that it would really work because we just thought it would be a name. We'll try to say this shouldn't happen, but the federal judge is gonna side with the police, right? Well, in actuality, they didn't. And I, the reason I say that is because 
as a psychologist, I could not only speak to what happened to me, but I could also speak to the research. And it was that moment when the judge started to ask me about my research, about racism, about what is this de-escalation you're talking about, about the work that I, I thought I was doing from the perspective of a, of a mental health professional, that she started to take more seriously the, the claims of the case. And so I'm not at all saying, oh, I, I, you know, I made that happen. It was my willingness to be a professional and also be engaged in my community um, that allowed me to be in the place to be able to speak to that. And so the way that you might get involved if you're passionate about the movement for black lives might not be clear to you, but be willing to do it because you can make a difference. Okay. So um, Jacob says, during a conversation regarding the most recent police shooting, are reluctant to get involved, hashtag Black Lives Matter, although they agree with the principles of the movement because they are afraid of being or being perceived as patronizing. I wonder how we might address this concern and encourage involvement by people in people of all identities. So can you read the first part again? Yes. So during a conversation regarding the most recent police shooting, yep. a reluctant to get involved, Black Lives Matter, get involved in Black Lives Matter, although they agree with the principles of the movement mm -hmm. because they are afraid of being or being perceived as patronizing. So they're, they're afraid of being seen as patronizing because they agree with Black Lives Matter? Is that your understanding? Yes. So it seems like they agree with the principles of what's, what's happening in Black Lives Matter, but yeah. they're afraid to get involved in how do we address the concerns and encourage people to get involved in all identities. So it makes me think of our white allies mm -hmm. who are reluctant to like beyond kind of the surface level of like agreeing with what's going on with the overall movement, but afraid to like further get involved because they don't want to be seen as like patronizing or taking over the movement themselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, honestly, I think everybody has a role. And so I'd tell them to, to read more and get connected with other. So if in particular, I can think of there's Asians for black lives. There's, um, a lot witnessing whiteness groups, right? Like, so there are different identities that have have created spaces where they think about what does it mean for them to um, be supportive of the movement for Black Lives. And the reality is, you know, an awareness that when Black Lives Matter, we might actually be at the point where all lives matter and the interconnectedness of that. So my first thoughts are encourage them to learn more. Uh, that it's not just a hashtag, that there's a lot to learn. So start with maybe that website and some other, other organizations. If they are white, um, have them check out Witnessing Whiteness. And so the YWCA has a series called Witnessing Whiteness that is based off the book. Ooh, now I can't remember the woman's name, but the name of the book is Witnessing Whiteness. But YWCA's mission is empowering women, eliminating racism. And one of the main pillars is they, they have pushed to, to try to, Cattle, be a catalyst for white allies who want to learn how to be an ally. And so that they're not just taking over, but that they are playing the role that they need to play in dismantling racism. Um, so that's the first thing that comes to mind. And then there's, you've, there have been different letter campaigns and different organizations that speak to, to Asian Americans for black lives. And um, so my, my, broadest point would be to encourage them to read more and maybe that means you need to get some resources to share with them that being involved or being passionate about the movement for black lives um, often it's, it's flattened like it becomes synonymous with being anti-police right like it becomes synonymous with so many things that it's not and I think it, that happens because people don't know better and so how do you inform them and not that that's necessarily your job, but can you push some resources their way so that from their social identity, they can also see why this matters. And then I often give people the example, if we think about sexism, you know, who gave women the right to vote? Well, white women, when, the, when it was voted on, right? And that's men. And so we can't assume that, oh yeah, we gotta just support black people being upset and fighting for their lives. Like we have to understand that it, it's always been uh, and understanding and, and work by those who are 
the oppressors and those who are oppressed to dismantle systems of oppression, that it's not just the burden of those who are oppressed. And that if you're going to be somebody who is in a privileged group, which, you know, we all have a landscape of privilege that we have to be willing to use and leverage our privilege to dismantle systems of oppression. It reminds me of what you said earlier about being the critical lover and making sure that you're being like a part of the whole community and including everyone in the conversation, just so we're not hearing one part of the dialogue. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think that if you think about even the movement for Black Lives, one of the main pillars has been centering intersectionality in terms of um, gender identity and, and sexual orientation. Right, right. And, and how you know, talk about things, but that must be all black people, not, not just straight, straight gendered black, black people. people. And, and so, so it's important to, to hold up hold that. Up that yeah. 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 I think yeah. that. Hi, can you all hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. Um, thank you, Dr. Banks, for leading this interactive discussion. It's been wonderful. I know that I myself have learned a plethora from it, especially in terms of taking care of myself. I've already taken some of the actions that you've suggested, such as getting off of social media sites. I'm not on Facebook literally right now because of that, and it's helped me significantly. Um, I also learned some new ways to get self-care, such as the racism recovery plan, um, and maybe journaling or joining some groups that are here. I live in Athens, but I'm very close to Atlanta, so I can definitely join the ABCI chapter out there. Yeah. Um, I hope that if any other students have any questions, that they can feel free to leave them in the comments or contact either Daisa and I or I, and we can connect you with them. Once again, this webinar will be posted on the Division 45 student website under the student webinar section. Um, if students want to get more active and involved, please contact Desa or myself in terms of getting involved with the student committee. If you are interested in activism and you will be at the division, I mean, the APA convention in Denver in a couple of weeks, we are going to be having a march in support of Black Lives Matter. Um, some of you may have received an email indicating that it's a protest. However, it has been turned into a march to support the movement and ways to figure out how we can be more active within um, the Black Lives Matter movement. Without further ado, Daisa, do you have any final comments? Yes, I yes, just want uh, uh, again, again. to my school for her help organize this. But to Dr. 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 I really appreciate you so much so much for taking the time. time. Um, um, and lastly, lastly, I apologize, I apologize you know, but, um, but um, Lastly, lastly, I want to say if you're interested in, in, in joining the plan is to is have more at our webinar for the next one. Um, um, it, it will be the first webinar. Uh, we um, will offer our webinar but, but we want to increase our participation as well. All right. Thank you, Dr. Banks, once again. Thank you all for tuning in. I hope that you engage in our future webinars. Thanks for having me. No problem. Bye. Bye.